Football colleagues, and welcome to the next episode of Dincast, where I'm delighted to be joined today by Poppy Trowbridge, who was a former Director of Communications uh, and a Special Advisor to the Chancellor of the Exchequer at the Treasury, and now very much in demand uh, communications consultant, strategist as well. So Poppy, welcome along. Thank you for having me. It's a That's pleasure. Great. Yeah, and so so today we're going to be exploring um, how you would develop a good policy and strategy, particularly in the disruptive times in which we live. Um, but I suppose you know, before we get on to that, it would be really helpful sort of just for you just to share a little bit about your sort of journey in your career and how you've ended up doing what you're doing. <laughs> Well, I was a, an economics journalist for a very long time, at 15 years, and uh, that time included the biggest financial crisis in a century. So the, the 2007 housing mortgage crisis and uh, in the UK, which then became global economic crisis. Um, and uh, I, I, I've always worked within economics and, and, and finance, and... Um, after the 2016 referendum here in the UK, uh, I was approached by uh, Philip Hammond's team to come and join them in the Treasury. Uh, he had just taken over. He'd been in the job a couple of weeks and they were looking for someone with a, a background steeped in economics and, and finance to be part of the Treasury team. And uh, the reason I left my journalism career to go and join the Treasury is twofold. One, I was really interested to learn about the one area of the financial crisis that I actually hadn't been exposed to, which was the government intervention side of things. And I thought this would be a great opportunity to, whilst not in an acute crisis, uh, learn about the mechanisms that are deployed by the government in, in a state of emergency, like the financial crisis. And two, because you may have clocked my accent, I grew up in Canada. And when I was a child there, we had a referendum on whether Quebec would separate and become its own country. And I was very interested in being part of the uh, democratic process around uh, this, this seismic, seismic event in, in, in Western European um, democratic uh, formation, nation state. So, so that combined, and, and, and then I, I suppose there's a sort of third reason, which is, to have a job like this in the civil service, in government, is a privilege. It is an honor. You you don't get many shots at it. And uh, when, when offered, seize it. And and I was there for nearly three years. Well, I mean, it's, it's interesting you mentioned. I mean, you clearly came in at a, at a critical time uh, for, as you say, from the financial crisis. So I, I just wondered then, how do you view the, the situation we're now in, where we've got this mm -hmm. sort of global pandemic? Are there any parallels? Oh, I'm sure there are. Um, most often I'm asked, does it feel the same, or sort of on the same level as the financial crisis? And uh, I think maybe for those working in industry or government, they, they might say yes, but in reality, it, it, it's nothing like it. So this, the collapse of the global financial system was a huge shock. It was the biggest disaster in 100 years in terms of business and industry. Countries were going bankrupt, um, institutions were collapsing, millions of people lost their homes and lost their jobs in the subprime crisis that, that followed. But there is just something universal about a health crisis where we are, we where it is no longer about where you work or how much money you have or don't have or how many homes or mortgages you have. It's about the people that you meet. It's about a basic human interaction, which is connecting and meeting with people and, and a transmiss transmissible disease. So I think I would say now in hindsight, they're nothing alike, but at the beginning, it, it did feel like it was a problem to be tackled with systems and precautions in the same way that the financial crisis was, was, the, was the same, tackled with emergency measures and then with a, a protective system. I think, I think now looking back, I'd, I'd say they're, they're obviously not comparable in any way. So, I mean, let's sort of explore now if, you know, if you were looking uh, to sort of advise organisations around developing good policy and good strategy. We are still living clearly in very, very mm. disrupted times. So for if you were sort of looking at an executive team, how would you work with them uh, in terms of designing the right policy uh, or the right strategy for their organisation as we now hopefully look to um, exit out of the, the pandemic? I'm going to park the crisis for a second, if you bear with me, because I do think um, 
many of the forces that work on, on current policymaking were already at play. Technology has completely changed the pace at which we work and live and govern and travel and et cetera. So, so that was already happening. Um, so with an increased pace of life and working, I think you know, policymaking also has to adjust. And I think it needs to adjust in, in, in the sense that it needs to be much more dynamic, much more flexible, much more iterative. Uh, and, it, and you have to fundamentally accept that the number of data points that will go into the process of making a good policy is exponentially uh, increased from, say, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. And therefore, the number of decisions will be exponentially increased. And therefore, you need to be more uh, flexible in, in your outcome. But broadly speaking, you know, you, you think about your outcome. You gather as much data from stakeholders as you possibly can. You draft your outcome or your policy or you, your, your desired sort of your desired change. But all, all whilst maintaining this idea that, that, that you, are, you are always working with an incomplete data set and therefore your desired outcome or desired policy needs to be flexible uh, to take that into account. Then you, dra you draft a policy, then you test it with stakeholders, you talk them through it. And we did this when we were in the treasury, when we were trying to come up with ideas, we, we got the data from stakeholders and said, okay, well, we've come up with this idea. How does this sound? How would this work? And, and then you suddenly realize that there's a whole new set data set from um, logistical implementation that you need to factor in. Then I would say, attack your policy from all sides, tear it to shreds, have it attacked and, and defend it and, and try and rip it to pieces and see if it withstands that kind of, uh, if it has that sort of resilience to cut and, and that there is a kernel of, of, of something that holds within it. And we did this constantly, every budget, and I think we did probably four budgets and two spring statements when I was there, you know, every policy is ripped to shreds. And it's, it's, it was my job to defend it and work. And, and in doing that, you find the weak spots and you find where you, you know, you don't get to reinforce all the weak spots. Sometimes you just need to acknowledge it's a weak spot, but at least you've worked out how um, resilient, how strong the sort of fundamental idea is. Um, and then you need, I believe, a really iterative implementation timeframe, possibly even uh, a limited one. Um, and I'll explain that in a second. The final sort of stage is, is to stay really open to the fact that if, if the facts change, your approach has to change. And sometimes something about your desired outcome or policy will have to change as well. So change is, is, is a part of good policy making. Um, and my, my point about the iterative implementation or the staged implementation, I, I mean, very broadly speaking, I'm thinking of something like the digital tax, which uh, Philip Hammond as chancellor brought in, but was very clear that this was a temporary tax that he needed to put in place until there was global coordination on transfer pricing. He didn't say, I want a digital tax because I want this revenue forever and ever and ever to be part of our, our calculations. He said, look, we're struggling to get global agreement on this. We have constant meetings, but no one gets anywhere. We're going to make the first move. The minute you're willing to meet us here, I'm willing to rethink this, this policy. Sugar tax is another one. Uh, it was announced with a two-year delay. That gave companies the time to reformulate and was an incredibly effective policy that was never implemented because because the industry was able to adapt. And I, and I think probably one of the simplest ways that policy can come a cropper is, is, is if it's designed with too much um, force in mind and too much, and too much definition in mind. There, you have to think about the behavioral change you're seeking, not the, the data that you want to come out of the, the policy algorithm at the end.
And that, that's fascinating. You raised a couple of really interesting points there. And I, I suppose from a leader's perspective, how do you get the balance right between, um, you know, what, you know, because you, you, data, you can get conflicting data. So mm-hmm. how do you get the balance right between staying the course that you've set out and deciding actually this is the right moment to change tack and, and pivot? That's a really good question. I think people who go into policy making, certainly in government or um, uh, in, in this in this industry, do it from a sense of, of genuine goodwill and desire to improve the system for the many, not the few. Um, there is a point at which the data is telling you that there is a serious problem here and someone needs to do something about it. So the digital tax is a good example, smoking, um, sugar, exercise, mental health. You know, we, we now, uh, employers are required to, uh, account for mental health e- as they have been required to account for physical health. And you get to a point where the, where the, the data is just telling you that this, this has to, this, you need to make this initial move. Um, the trick is to know how much you really don't know about the outcome, about the behavioral change, about how permanent that will be, and to then be ready to adjust your destination along the way. And I, I really think that that's one of the key elements of modern policymaking, which is to be constantly processing the, um, the new data and to be a little bit less um, prescriptive about the destination and a lot more cognizant of the behavioral change that you're seeking. I think also a really important thing to recognize is that you, you, you absolutely comprehensively cannot force change. And the only way to, you know, to make good policy, especially if it requires some some tough changes, uh, is to bring people along with you. And that is done through uh, communication, through sharing of, of, I keep saying data, but I mean information through the, the advice of experts, that we are living in the information age. And you you must trust your stakeholders, whether it's the public or um, your shareholders or regulators, that they they can process the information, they can process the data, they can process the expert opinion, and and they they actually can make informed decisions. And again, those informed decisions uh, in response to your policy are another data set for you. So, I mean, you mentioned um, stakeholders in a sort of a number of times. I, I just wondered, uh, I mean, we talked earlier about actually we now live in a, in a global one system uh, across the world. How do you know you are reaching the right stakeholders? Because I suppose the risk might be that you go to the same familiar people um, and yet we've got lots and lots of different groups now who will have a view or a perceptive. So how do you get to that right voice? So I'd, I'd say three things. One, there is no right voice. Voice. Anyone with an opinion, an attitude um, about what you're doing is a stakeholder, full stop, and they have a valuable contribution to make. Two, I think it's always up to you to create within your policymaking structure a representative of the most vulnerable stakeholders. Imagine who they are, try to figure out who, they will be the the one group of stakeholders that will not have a voice in the process. And you need to create the space and be that voice, even against your own outcome or your own policy. Um, That it is a very dangerous omission to to advocate, to lobby yourself on behalf of the most vulnerable stakeholders uh, affected by what you're doing. Uh, it's a very, that is, a, I believe, very dangerous oversight. And then I suppose my third point is you're sort of asking the wrong person because I was making a lot of policy in, in, in working on a lot of policy in, in politics. And of course, every single voter on the street is, is a stakeholder for us. Anyone who, even if you didn't vote, but you read the newspapers, you're a stakeholder. If you, if you didn't vote, but you um, want to buy the can of Coke that we're asking you to uh, we're asking you to pay a sugar tax on you're a stakeholder so for politicians every 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 human being they encounter is a stakeholder in that sense so um, oh, that causes its own problems but 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 I, I, there was no one eliminated from our group and there was no right stakeholder for us because the answer was it's it's absolutely everybody. 
So uh, in terms of that engagement, then, uh, it, it sounds like or it feels like we're living in an increasingly complex world for leaders and organisations where, where everybody has a voice now. So I just wondered in terms of when you're working with your clients, you know, how are you supporting them or advising them that they can capture these voices so that, that say, the, the, the policy they think is good doesn't turn bad very quickly? Simply, I think that can be avoided to a large degree if you maintain the attitude that you don't know best and that you don't need to protect or hide information, that it is actually, I believe, really okay to, to make policy in the public eye. In, and that might be in the public public eye or that might be in a room with your stakeholders. Uh, I I. It may take a little longer. There may be some things that you kind of just need to sit through and listen to. But, but the chances of you making a mistake, or which are usually derived from great oversight, are reduced if you're willing to go through the process in the public sphere. So either you know communicating it through newspapers if you're a politician to get some feedback, see where you go, talk to the public about it, or whether it's uh, with your own um, industry stakeholders, so doctors, you know, for example, um, if you're a pharmaceutical company looking to to, to make change, it, it's a, it's perhaps a slower process, but it is you know it is it is I think essential in this information age. Number one, and because your stakeholders are more informed than uh, you probably think they are, and two the data is constantly changing and there are so many more mechanisms for your stakeholders to feed back. You need those, you need to, to be aware of what all of those channels are and all of that data. We're not, I don't know if you've ever read um, A Power Broker, the, the, the book about um, Moses, who was the civil the public servant in, in New York, who, who decided he was gonna put in transport links across New York. And he did, you know, just bulldozed down neighborhoods and rammed through highways and built bridges. He decided where the roads were going to go and he put the roads there. And if people were in the way, he cleared them off. I mean, that, that era is, is, is fundamentally over because uh, we live in a very globalized world and we share the same uh, atmosphere, literally the same environment. Um, we now, we saw through the financial crisis that, that our financial system, our money system is totally globalized. Uh, our travel is totally globalized, and of course, what we're living through now has told us that our that our that our various health systems are completely linked, and, and in fact, one global health system. So, um, policymaking has now got to come out of the the the, the boardroom and 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 be made uh, in in a much more uh, public way, I believe. So I, I just wanted to sort of take me back to your time when you were working as, as an advisor and, and you would have had an instinct for actually this is really good policy, but quite often through the stakeholder engagement, you might have been getting some blocks or some barriers to this. So how did you, um, I suppose, get round or through or over some of those barriers to get that good policy implemented? There's always a conflict between short-term impact and long-term impact of, of, of the change that you want to make. Um, politics obviously struggles to prioritize the long-term impact over the short-term impact. We see that, we see that a lot. Um, but I do think one of the things that, one of the practices that the, the, the team that I worked with uh, used, which I thought was really useful, was to think 20, 50 years beyond the moment that you are expecting the desired change. So if you're looking, you know, we, we looked a lot at changing housing policy and building policy because we have a housing shortage in this in, in the UK. But to think beyond the end of your parliamentary term, um, to think beyond, you know, the lifetime of the cohort just coming into kind of the working system to into the labor force, to think add 50 or, you know, 60 or 70 years onto it. And it does suddenly give you a sort of zoomed out perspective. So I, one of my tips would be to think beyond what you think your time frame is, just to see how it changes your perspective and what that might feed back into the, what you think you can achieve in your, in your time frame. Um, 
And the other one, I, I've mentioned the sort of impermanence, the digital tax, how you, you, can, you can make policy that isn't permanent and achieve the change you want, remove the policy and still maintain the change. I think that's a really valuable approach. And look, it's, it's, it's absolutely true that people don't always know what's good for them. You know, smoking, sugar, uh, all sorts of things, but you can't force the change. Um, and so rather than thinking of yourself as a policymaker, you've got to think of yourself as a, as a, as a change facilitator. I mean, forgive those silly phrases, but, but that one is a top down, here's the rule. And the other is I, I want to help you make better choices. What, can I do to help you on that way? And I think I think this is where behavioral economics is becoming, you know, an essential part of um, of good policy making. So I think you know those leaders that know good policy but are struggling to implement it well could uh, find breakthroughs in in that in that standoff by adopting some some of the techniques of behavioral economics. Yeah, I, I suppose the, the measure of you know what we impact we have will we'll in the future be you know, whether we are good ancestors and you know whether people will look back at us and what, what we've done is good. Uh, well, look, probably uh, we've come to the end of our time. Thank you so much uh, for sharing those insights. That's really really helpful and uh, really enjoy chatting to you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs>